So Hi, I'm, I'm Fabio Cavalcanti. I'm, uh, I'm part of the engineering team uh, on Azure Functions. And I'm Matt Anderson. I'm a program manager on the Azure Functions team. And today we're here to talk about, well, uh, one of our favorite things, which is .NET on Azure Functions. Um, we're kind of going through a, a couple of different um, aspects of it. We'll talk about the agenda in a moment. But just a reminder, they always want you to do the session survey. We love feedback, um, so please absolutely do that. Uh, we'll be putting this up at the end again. And then, whoa, hey there. Um, so for the agenda, we're going to be just doing a quick lap around functions in case anybody here isn't uh, super familiar. We'll make sure we cover all the bases, what it means, how some of those concepts translate, and then how you start bringing in all the goodness of .NET's uh, most modern capabilities and apply that to Azure Functions. Um, so hopefully a lot of it actually feels very familiar as we go. Um, I'm not getting audio, is that? Oh, but I feel my, yeah. Oh. All right, I can project more. That's fine. Better? Cool. All right. Um, just to re uh, restate that, uh, yeah, so we're going to be talking about functions. We'll do kind of a quick lap around the product, make sure everybody's familiar with the concepts, have a solid baseline, and then we'll be showing how you apply all the latest and modern capabilities of .NET to that. Um, bringing that all together is one nice crazy vision, and uh, yeah, we're going to try and jump through it. We got some slideware, but then we're going to spend a lot of time in demos, and then hopefully just plenty of uh, time for Q&A at the end. So when we talk about functions, you're going to hear this word serverless come up. Serverless is really just kind of a continuation of a trend that's been going on in the cloud of increasing abstraction so that you're able to spend less time focusing on certain pieces of infrastructure that may not be unique to your platform or whatever. Um, you're, it's not stuff that's value add that you're bringing uh, in the type of product that you're trying to deliver. So it's about owning less and focusing your attention on what really matters to you. Um, that's the ultimate goal of the serverless concept. So we try and move away from infrastructure where we can. Obviously, there's going to be places uh, where you're going to have to have some. Uh, certainly, there are plenty of pure serverless apps out there, but a lot of them are also just a mix of some more serverless type things or more traditional technologies as well, where, yes, there's still going to be some operations. But for the serverless pieces, you have less to worry about there. You're going to be able to react to all sorts of events and have your infrastructure scale for you. That's not something you have to reason about. It's going to happen in response to the load that it's seeing. And in a lot of the models, uh, it's paper use. So you're only spending uh, money when the code is actually running. And if it's not actually doing anything, then it's not uh, on your bottom line. So we bring functions. So like functions as a service, the, the general pattern here is one aspect of serverless. There's plenty of other technologies as well. Um, but it does encapsulate the, the general mission and sort of the reason this trend is caught on uh, in a lot of ways. You have functions that have single responsibility. They do one thing. Uh, they're not um, you know, trying to uh, have the entire world captured in one function. Um, you break your app into discrete components that are more easy to reason about, manage, test, all that good stuff. Um, Short-lived, we're not running you know, super long-lived workers or having major amounts of state. We tend towards stateless. Um, more I.O. bound and CPU bound typically, although there's, uh, you can kind of go both directions. And then the scalability and making sure that that aspect of the infrastructure management is out of the way is, is a huge part of it as well. So that's kind of the, the general space itself. Um, when we talk about functions, we have some, a function is, well, some event that causes a function to be invoked, a piece of code that actually does something with that. And then perhaps there's some outputs and things like that. That's the general gist of it. So we have a couple different concepts of triggers, things that cause your event to run. That could be a message going into a queue, image being uploaded to a blob store, uh, HTTP request, timer event, those types of things. Uh, we're going to be talking mostly about .NET and things like that, so well, exclusively about .NET. Um, the, uh, the, so your code is just a standard .NET process. But we also have some things to facilitate working with those other services, but you can always uh, you know, do um, anything that works well for, uh, for how you build your apps. So I mentioned that sort of scaling and responding to events. So uh, ignore a, a lot of the words here uh, on the slide. Um, the general idea is that you start at zero, no code running because there's no events coming in. Events come into the system, system scales up, make sure that you're able to process those. When it burns through the backlog, it scales back down. And so again, you're not paying for it if it's not running, and that's one of the key things for a lot of folks when they look to serverless and functions. Is you can frankly make some good cost savings if your load has sort of spiked. If you're getting like constant load of, you know, certain volumes and things like that, 
that model doesn't you know, necessarily uh, provide as much benefit. But in general, the elasticity and being able to react to, hey, suddenly you've got a surge of traffic you weren't expecting, um, the system's able to just handle it. That's a, that's a nice value of these types of things. So people use it for a lot. I mentioned sometimes you see fully serverless applications, sometimes you see it as a single function that's added to an, say, web stack, um, where it's just doing one thing, it's providing utility. Um, surprisingly common one maybe is uh, we see a lot of people doing like imagery size upload type things. So have a website, allow it to take image uploads, do some resizing operation in the background, put it there and let the web, uh, web app serve it from, from that point forward. Um, so you can start small, you can go all in, either way is valid, um, but it's a handy tool that you can apply to a bunch of different situations. So uh, that's enough of a kind of uh, me prattling on the virtues of functions. Um, let's assume we want to do it. Uh, how do you get going? Make sure you have the Azure development uh, modules installed in your Visual Studio. And then from there, uh, well, we're just going to get right into jumping over to the VS and making it happen. Yeah, we have a, a few demos we, we want to share with you all today. But we figured we'll spend a little bit of time. How many of you have some level of experience with functions? Just a quick show of hands. Cool. Okay, thanks. Some, good number of you. Uh, we wanted to take, before we, we jump into demos, we wanted to show a little bit of the experience starting from the very beginning. If I need to create a project, what does that look like? A lot of times when we jump into the demo, some of that gets a little hazy. So we want to show, once you have this workload that Matthew just mentioned, installed in VS, what does that, that process look like? Um, so I'm just kind of starting instance of VS here to show that, that flow end to end. And I'm just going to hit create project. I happen to have functions as one of my recent project templates. Um, but if you have the, the, the workload installed, you're going to see that as one of the, the project templates that, that is supported out of the box and present in VS. Uh, as I go through the, this flow here, I can name my function, and I'll have a, a few options that I, I, I can choose from. .NET 7 is what I want to use today, um, the latest in, in creator supported uh, .NET version. Um, I'm going to go with that. For our overview, our intro right now, let's just stick with a, a queue trigger. Uh, we'll have a, a couple of other demos showing HTTP endpoints, but let's, let's pretend we want to create something that will respond to a, a message being sent to a, an Azure storage queue. Um, for our demo, we'll just use the, the local emulator. Um, we can leave the, the connection string empty here, as you will default um, in your local experience to the emulator. Queue name, we'll just use what, what we have in, the, in this dialog. And with those clicks, I have a running local project. Uh, I have a function that is uh, set up that is uh, showing some, a pattern and some, some features that we'll dive into, uh, dive a little deeper into a little later as part of the demos, but it shows dependency injection, taking a dependency on logger factory, using logging, uh, and we are showing a queue trigger set up pointing to the container that we defined when we started, started that function. If you look at the project structure, this is very similar to what you would see if you're working with a, a standard console app. Uh, and that's one of the things that we want to we want to drive today is that if you're familiar with .NET, um, if uh, you work with ASP.NET Core, if you work with uh, .NET applications for different types of workloads, all of those skills will transfer. And we have been working very hard to make sure that is a good alignment with the, the, the rest of the ecosystem, that it fits well and uses the same set of uh, abstractions and APIs available for the other tech stacks, .NET is tech stacks that you are, you are familiar with. Yeah, your primary difference here is what you can see on screen of the attributes that are defining the actual trigger and the function itself in the, uh, as part of that handler. And if I switch to my entry point, the entry point of the application, uh, you see how this is all bootstrapped and you have full control over these. You, you can configure how the application is uh, uh, bootstrapped. You, this is the same set of APIs you would use in different application types. Uh, so service injection, uh, using uh, more advanced features that require access to the, the builder. You have access to all of that here. Um, and uh, for the model that we're going to be looking at today, uh, you own main. You own the process. You, you have full control over the, the, the dependency, uh, the, the set of dependencies brought into the application. Um, it, the, that's how the, the application is structured. And then we can run this just as a, a quick validation and demo. And then as part of that, let's put a breakpoint here so we can see 
something actually happening. Uh, I have now the, the app running. Uh, using what we call core tools. This is integrated once you install the, the functions workloads in, in, in Visual Studio. Core tools will be automatically there um, and automatically updated for you. Uh, this is using the same runtime uh, that, that runs on Azure. So this is not an emulation. This is the, the same exact set of bits, uh, gi giving you really good fidelity with what you would expect to see the application do once you finally deploy uh, the app. Um, for our demo, we use um, Storage Explorer. We're just pointing to the, the local emulator, as I mentioned. So I'll just uh, pick up the, the queues, um, the, the queue that, that we are using from our app, and let's, uh, let's just add a quick message to it. So we're using the storage emulator here, but uh, especially for you know, different event types and things like that, you may not always have an emulator. So when doing local, a lot of folks also connect directly to an Azure hosted resource as well. So we'll just enqueue a message. What we should see here is that this message will be picked up. Uh, we're seeing the, the queue trigger being executed here. I didn't have my, my breakpoint mount. So I will redo that so we can see that. If we refresh, we'll see that messages has been consumed. Um, I'll just queue another message here that, that says hello. We'll see our breakpoint coming in with the content of my message. Pretty straightforward, pretty simple. But hopefully that helps understand how do I how do I get started with this? If I wanted to create a project right now, um, how would I get this going? And the, when I selected queues uh, when I was going through the, the project uh, dialog, uh, we have a lot of different uh, starter templates. You can start with HTTP triggers, uh, queues, blobs. We support a number of services and integrations out of the box that you can you can just leverage uh, as part of your function. So with this out of the way, the, the next step here would be to, to publish. So I want to show a little bit. So that's the, the last leg, right? I have this working. I've built this locally. Uh, I was able to, to debug locally. Now I want to get this actually on the cloud. And you have the ability to do it straight from the S. You have the ability to, to publish directly to, to Azure. Um, by following these steps, uh, you will be able to provision resources. You'll be able to do everything you need to do to get the application running. Uh, but of course, we also support more advanced CI CD pipelines uh, and, and deployments that integrate with uh, you know, your repo and, and with your application management uh, lifecycle. And, and VS will help you set those up as well. So, with that, uh, in that context, um, I want to jump into some of the demos that we have uh, uh, prepared for you all today. We wanted to show some. Uh, .NET features that the team has been working on, uh, some features that are, some of them are maybe uh, a bit newer and, and some of them may be unfamiliar with, even if you've been working with functions for a while. So it's something that we wanted to, to highlight and make sure that, that you are aware of. So I have two different projects here. We'll start out by looking at this HTTP download project. Uh, if we look at the, the, the entry point of the app, um, very similar to what we looked at uh, for the, the, the application that we just created with File New. So not a lot of changes happening here. Um, Except one. Yeah, that, a small change that, that you will notice is that we are enabling uh, some additional web application integration with uh, this application here. What that means is that we are bringing in a deeper integration into ASP.NET Core. Um, so there is a, a, a new extens extension that you have the ability to, to reference that will give you access to richer, uh, a richer set of types, the same set of abstractions that you use uh, when you're working with a .NET Core, core app. And uh, we can see that when we actually go into the, the function implementation. So if I collapse this, you'll see that, that I'm using the HTTP request uh, that you may be familiar with if you're ex experienced with ASP.NET Core. Uh, I'm using some more advanced features here when I'm using uh, the blob input uh, which is a, I'm actually taking a, a blob stream. Uh, and now that I mentioned input, one, one thing that will be good to mention as well is this concept of uh, bindings that exist in functions. And there are three different types of bindings. You have triggers, uh, which are primarily responsible for running your app. is what you define as the event source uh, for your, your code. Uh, in this case, we're using an HTTP uh, trigger. So HTTP requests will cause this function to run. And in the previous example, you saw it was a queue trigger, right? So. 
Uh, and in addition to the, the, the triggers, we have inputs, uh, which you can have many of as part of your function. So those are, that's any additional data that you want to have passed into your code uh, as that function is triggered. So functions will make sure that we resolve uh, those inputs, all of that data, and make sure that when your code is, is executed, those references are passed to you. Uh, so uh, this creates, Matthew talked a little bit about the abstraction that, that serverless provides over uh, the platform and servers. You don't have to worry about you know, patching machines and, and, and maintaining the platform yourself. This is another set of abstractions that, that's kind of unique to Azure Functions over services that, that we integrate with out of the box. Uh, so this gives you the ability to work with services like Blob um, services, uh, the, the Azure Storage Blob. In this case, I'm not using anything um, directly from the service. I'm not, not using uh, the SDK directly. All I'm doing is I'm taking a standard .NET stream, and I'm saying, hey, when you get this blob, just give me that stream. I just want to consume that. So in that spirit of owning less, right, we're not actually going through any of the mechanics of dealing with the service. We're dealing with the data that are like that's the actual thing that we want this function to operate on. That's what we're going for. So trying to encapsulate as much as that so that the, the only lines of code we're writing here are hopefully more valuable ones. Yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and run this uh, so we can see this in action. Uh, if you noticed what I have defined as my, uh, well, actually one, one additional binding type that I, I forgot to mention is that as I was going through is the, our output binding. So you have your inputs, as a result of your function running, you can also define a set of outputs that, that you create um, that will provide the same level of uh, abstraction on top of uh, services that we, int we integrate with. For this function, um, if you notice, I have a reference here to a blob in a container called runtime, and I'm just using this blob name here. Um, is that .NET 8 preview My guess what this is. So yeah. we, we okay. need .NET 8 here at some point, so we figured we might as well create a function that, that will bring this down from um, a container in storage. Uh, this is, again, using emulator. Uh, so we have uh, the function running. And this will show a simple but very common scenario in functions, which is the ability for you to very efficiently uh, download the respond to an HTTP request with a, a payload that is coming from, um, from storage uh, in this particular scenario. Uh, and this is done, if you, if you go back to the, the application graph here, one of the things that I did want to show is that this is processing that data very efficiently for you, uh, which is one of the things that, that the team has been spending a lot of time uh, making sure that uh, communication with these underlying services, uh, even with the, the, the more recent models, the, the isolation mo models, that they are efficient, uh, that you have the ability to very easily uh, meet those requirements for these types of workloads. So just to put a point on that, your memory graph looked like it was, what, 40 megahertz tops? Yes. Whereas the payload itself was something like 200. And so uh, we weren't allocating additional memory or anything like that. Um, one thing that maybe I, I glossed over is the, the, the billing where we're doing based on time. It's actually memory over time. So the, the amount of memory you're consuming also matters for that sort of model. So things like this translate directly to savings, which is a, a, something that we, we want to make sure that like, we're not creating additional pressure. And this also points to patterns for your application. Um, you know, if you're dealing with a bunch of different event sources or data sources, um, we'll talk a little bit about things like connection pooling in a bit but you don't want to over-allocate things and create additional uh, pressure in your system. So there are a few things like that that are good to watch for in functions. Yeah, so in, in addition to the, the programming model, uh, using the ESP.NET Core abstractions, the, the additional types that we have the ability to support for uh, bindings, uh, this shows uh, a lot of performance work that's been done by the team in the result of, of that. Um, with these models, like throughput enhancements, it's what you would expect. Uh, in the traditional consumption-based scenarios, it still benefits you, but if you're moving towards uh, any of the dedicated type plans, elastic premium plans, that's where you see a substantial uh, difference uh, based on this kind of uh, performance and improvements. The other demo that we, we wanted to show is a demo that will highlight some additional .NET features, but in the context of um, functions. 
So we have this HTTP client factory project, um, and uh, we'll start out with that project. Uh, what you'll see here is that we are demonstrating uh, basic this dependency injection usage in functions uh, in this model. In this case, we're using the, the standard HTTP uh, factory, client factory functionality. Uh, this is identical to uh, the way you would use the same feature set in any other application type. If you're using HTTP client factory, again, in the SPNet, in a console app, the code will look identical to this. Um, it's the same set of APIs, same thing. Uh, there's nothing function specific about this. You are registering the services the same exact way. Um, and if I shift to the, the function here, uh, we'll be able to see how the function is actually taking in those dependencies and make you, making use of those services. In this case, we're seeing, we're taking a, uh, an iLogger that's being passed in. This is the I injected, and we are using the, the HTTP client factory. Um, when the function is uh, ultimately executed, uh, you see that, that we have the request being passed in. We are taking the cancellation token for that, that function. Uh, we create a client using the standard APIs available to us from uh, the HTTP client factory. Uh, we are registering a named client, so we are retrieving a client that is specific to this function uh, with this name that gives us uh, uh, just basic configuration. So it centralizes the way you're configuring those clients, uh, where you're registering the client with the, the factory. Um, and, and it importantly means you're getting connection pooling, which yeah. is one of the things that I think people run into a lot with these highly elastic solutions. Um, you're going to have tons of invocations potentially happening all at once, and that's great until you exhaust all of your ports or um, you maybe uh, DDoS one of your own uh, downstream dependencies uh, because you have so many connections being opened against it. Um, so DI is the same everywhere, but oh boy, it's an important thing to remember when you're dealing with functions. Yeah, so this highlights both dependency injection, uh, but proper management of, the, if you see here, this function is not dealing with lifetime, lifetime management for that, that HTTP client instance. Uh, it's all using the best practices that have been put in place, and we are just leveraging the, the standard .NET capabilities. Again, trying to emphasize that, hey, your .NET skills transfer and apply here. Uh, the same concepts uh, will, be, will be used. Uh, once we get uh, that client, uh, we are, we'll be disposing the, of this client at the end of the, um, the this, when the scope of this, this function is, is finished, but we are, we, downloading a string, we are downloading a payload, we do expect this payload to be an HTML payload. Um, we're just using the base URI that was again configured for that client, uh, so we're just looking for the exact resource we're looking for, um, and passing that result back as part of our response. If I was to run this function. All right, so for this example, we've got a client that's pointing at the docs, and then we're then uh, using that to pull information back and resurface it, right? Yeah, so this, this shows uh, this function calling a downstream API. It's a, this, this sample may be a bit contrived, but it, it shows a very real scenario that we see customers uh, using in functions all the time. As part of your function, it's very, very common that you're going, going to be communicating with downstream APIs and showing how to do that efficiently, getting some content, passing that back to the client in this case. You might have noticed when I ran this function that, that I have uh, another function defined here. Uh, this is a super simple function. Uh, it's just going to return a greeting um, back to me. So if I run this, it, I get this greeting back. If we look at how this function is actually implemented, I'll keep it running here so that we can see um, the different things this function has the ability to do. Uh, so similar things to what we've seen before. We're passing in a logger. Um, in this case, we're not actually using that, um, but we, we're simply looking at the, the request, seeing if we have a, a query string with a, a name associated with that request. If I am providing my name, if I pass my name in, uh, I'm returning a more personalized greeting, uh, and otherwise, I'm just re returning a very general greeting. Uh, that's what we're seeing here. So if I was to pass uh, a name, this would return a different greeting to me. And the way I'm doing that is, uh, again, 
standard .NET features using resource files. I'm using ResX here. I'm just uh, pulling the, the resources and uh, returning the grading uh, that is appropriate based on the context, based on what data I have been passed to my function. Um, maybe you're wondering, okay, the, the, the sample we looked at before, it seems a little more complex. Seems like we, we're taking a step back here, but we wanted to highlight a, another capability, another feature uh, that is available to you uh, in functions, which is the ability for you to register middleware in the application in invocation pipeline. So very similar to what you have the ability to do, again, in the ASP.NET Core, where you have the ability to register middleware that will be in the HTTP um, invocation pipeline, you have the ability to do the same thing for event-based workloads with, with functions. Um, so if we go back to my, my bootstrapping code, and if I expand uh, these first few lines here, you will see that we are using the same builder pattern, we are using the same, the same pattern for dependency registration and middleware injection uh, to inject the functions specific middleware. So this is a middleware that will provide a context that um, is compatible with different, that, that is not HTTP centric, uh, that will work for any event type that is supported by functions. So let, let's take a look at what this middleware is actually doing. Because in this particular, for this particular middleware, we are actually looking specifically for HTTP triggered functions. Uh, by using some of the, the newer APIs uh, that will give us access to some of the, the ESP.NET Core features. Uh, in this case, we have the, the context that I described. This will, will, is a context that will carry uh, event information for uh, any event type, any of the bindings, any event source that you're using. Uh, for this example, we are getting the HTTP context associated with that. That invocation. Before we leave that point, that function context is also something that can be passed in uh, to your functions. This is uh, something that we see people yep. using for getting information about the actual triggering context and things like that. Um, that's a generally useful object to, to, to know about and be referencing in your function code or in the middleware itself. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, in this case, we, we only want to deal with HTTP requests. Um, so we're actually checking to see, hey, did we actually have an HTTP context associated with this invocation? If we did, do we have this additional query string? We're trying to do something different here. Maybe we have a pattern where our clients will be passing a query string telling us, hey, there is a different culture that, that I want you to apply to my, my request here. Uh, and if that is the case, we just apply that to the current thread and current UI culture. Again, .NET features that have been around for uh, a long time, uh, showing how to leverage a lot of uh, that, that using, using functions. Some folks also use uh, serverless and functions to work with integrating existing solutions and code bases. Middleware is a great way of translating workloads and either uh, matching schemas or getting things into the right shape so that they interface well with, say, a legacy library or things like that that you have, um, while still being able to present whatever the newer modern thing or you know whatever the new application that you're building is. Yeah, but again, highlighting how I, I can leverage .NET features that you're all pretty, probably pretty familiar with. Uh, and if you look back at my function, my function is not doing anything to, to deal with culture. There's no logic here to identify uh, the language. It's all based on the, the, the functionality that is available to me from .NET and the fact that we injected that piece of middleware that is now setting the context for when the function is, is invoked. So if, if I was to run that, and actually pass that the query string. Um, Gave it away earlier with your I, I did. <laughs> that passes that, so automatically I have the resource resolution now giving me a, a localized uh, version of that string and a greeting that then matches my, my preferred language. I didn't know that Azure Functions was just Azure Functions in Portuguese. <laughs> So you'll learn more than just .NET in these talks. Yeah. <laughs> um, we did, one of the things that, that we got to highlight too is that we talked about how this middleware is a great way for you to address cross-cutting concerns, right? So anything that uh, you don't want to repeat as part of every function definition, build a middleware, you have the ability to handle with a, a lot of that stuff, uh, keeping your functions simple, keeping that code simple. Single responsibility, own less. So if we go back to the initial function that we looked at, that was going down to that uh, you know, downstream API, 
uh, that we are calling to get the, the document with the overview for functions. Now that we have that middleware injected, we have the ability to essentially do the same thing, and I can call this uh, client factory function, but I can pass the, the same culture query string. That middleware will set up the same context and that is going to return a, a, a version of that, that content that matches as long as the downstream API supports that. We are setting up the context when we build the HTTP client that is used by, by the function. Again, the function didn't have to be modified. Uh, the code is exactly the same. Uh, just by having the, the middleware there, we're taking care of that cross-cutting concern. We're taking care of uh, the logic that will influence the, the, the behavior of the function. And if we look back at how the client was set up, we're simply taking the, the culture that we have in the context and setting that as the part of the default headers uh, for the accept language for that, that HTTP client. We did have a quick question come up. Do you want to just ask that real quick? Yeah, so the question was just, can we look at the My Culture middleware again? Yeah. So, yeah, explaining how the... the, the, the uh, how it was invoked, invoked, how it was... Yeah, so the, the any middleware that you register, you, we do provide a set of APIs that will let you uh, register conditional middleware, which... Um, will depend on a, a trigger type or some logic that you may add here. In this case, we're using this builder pattern and injected that, that piece of middleware. When we call this uh, uh, use middleware method, uh, passing this middleware type, this is injecting this middleware into the middleware pipeline uh, that is used by functions. So from that point on, every invocation that gets dispatched to a function, before it reaches your function, will go through this middleware chain. Uh, Ordering here matters, uh, the, same, the same rules and logic that, that applies to ASP.NET Core applies here for, uh, to function middleware registration as well. Uh, as you register, then they will be executed in the same order of registration, and it will be a middleware chain. So and, yeah, and yeah, if you jump back in there, if you, the sequencing matters, and you'll notice that the, the, the thing we will return is sort of this next bit. So pointing to the next middleware that's going to be invoked. Yeah, and this gives you the ability to chain. Uh, as if I wanted to, this middleware could be uh, providing some logic. It could be running some logic that would decide if I just want to short circuit my, my invocation. Uh, if I want to do that, I don't have to call next. I can change my logic here. So the same, the same things you have the ability to do with uh, ASP.NET Core middleware, that, that applies here as well. Uh, for HTTP scenarios, people use this for like authorization filtering um, for other uh, trigger types, um, sometimes uh, just even data format, like what is the serialized message in the queue? Is it in the right format and encoding? Um, is it what we expect? Is it missing properties and things like that? Um, you can do some of those validation tasks as part of the middleware and then keep the function to where it's assuming uh, a certain amount of integrity of, of the data that's coming in. And from here you have, a, I just wanna show some of the, the properties and methods available to you uh, in the context that is passed into the to the middleware. Uh, there's a lot that you can do here uh, to inspect the function that's being evoked, the bindings that were used, uh, features associated with that context, uh, the actual function definition, um, scoped services, and, and so on. Does that help? Does that? Yeah, but this shows um, the, the registration of, of the middleware, how the logic um, applies to the the, the different functions that we have defined here uh, and how they, they react differently based on how that the logic is handled outside of the function logic. Okay, so we've looked at how a uh, function project is actually laid out. We've kind of gone through some of the features that we have there, um, you may have noticed when we were looking at the CS project, there's a few previews going on in there as well. Um, so this is all some, uh, some of the newer things. We've got a project going, we're, we're, we're ready to take it to Azure. We have that right-click publish or um, CI, uh, CD pipelines if we're being a little safer. Where does it go? So we have a couple different hosting options for functions and sort of how you can set things up. The two main ones I wanna highlight are the consumption plan and the elastic premium plan. 
So the consumption plan is exactly the model that we were describing earlier um, to a T. It scales down to zero, that's where we're starting. As events come in, it scales up, deals with them, and then scales back down. You're paying for the amount of time your uh, code is running and how much memory it's, it's taking as it does. Um, there are some limits there um, that you know, uh, help guide things. Um, like I said earlier, we want kind of short-lived functions and things like that, and you also don't want to run away build. So execution is bounded to five, can be raised to 10 minutes, um, and things like that. So those are some things to note as you're kind of evaluating different options. But consumption is where most people land. That's the sort of default, like what people uh, go to with functions. If you need additional networking integrations, or uh, if you don't want to have that kind of coming up from zero to sing first instance, um, you can have a pre-warmed instance. Those types of things are exposed through the Elastic Premium plan. So typically what we recommend is start with consumption, see if it meets your needs, but if you see that there's something that's kind of lacking there, the Elastic Premium plan is a really good option for kind of getting a few more of those controls and sort of uh, blending between that event-driven scaling, but also how you're managing uh, instances and things that you might be more familiar with if you're familiar with like an app service plan or something like that. And speaking of, um, if you're familiar with web apps or app service, um, app service plans, app service environments, these are all concepts that work in functions. Um, ultimately, the resource that you're working with uh, in Azure and like the Azure Resource Manager is uh, Microsoft.web slash sites. It's all the same. So if you're familiar with those products, a lot of things already work. But if you have app service plans that are sitting around that maybe aren't using you know, all of their resources, throwing functions on those is a good way of, you know, especially if they have affinity with those web apps, um, it's a good way of just kind of, you're not paying extra for the extra site going into that pool of resources already. Um, so uh, those are like the main uh, ones that I'll, I'll flag as sort of uh, the premier. There's certainly some other options we can talk about. One that's newer is we have, as part of Azure Container Apps, uh, the ability to run functions uh, in there as well. Um, that's currently in preview, um, so a little bit newer, but provides a really nice uh, option if you're looking to integrate functions and some other container-based workloads. Um, in fact, a pattern that's fairly common uh, in some cases is, especially if you need like a long-running task of some unbounded length, you might use functions to kick off a job that then uh, takes you know a longer uh, a longer execution time and then deals with you know have other functions that respond to the output. Um, the other thing to note is that I've talked only so far about managed services that directly say here, put functions here, here's a function app. We do have other options as well. Um, functions is open source, our runtime is available. Uh, we have published base images. If you wanna take those and throw those in any Kubernetes cluster you happen to have lying around, by all means. Um, uh, there's a bunch of different ways that you can kind of run functions in various places. Um, those options are all great and uh, we're happy to have folks doing that wherever it makes sense. Um, but typically, we, we point people to start with the consumption plan and then evaluate how that works uh, in terms of like informing other options. Start there. But then once we've started using functions, perhaps maybe we're getting a bit more, uh, more of them. We're having lots of them. They might be part of overall orchestrations, chains of logic that we have to deal with where our actual business logic is kicking in might be sometimes between the functions. Uh, orchestrations can be uh, a good time uh, always. Um, there's a lot that can uh, be challenging about doing orchestration logic. Durable functions is an extension that makes this way easier. Um, specifically, durable exposes new triggers and bindings that allow you to define the orchestration itself, checkpoint it, so that it is tolerant to uh, restarts, failures, and all sorts of things like that. Um, and keep that orchestration state as it kind of works itself through multiple different functions, which might be spread out doing lots of uh, things. Um, I mentioned like the time window for an individual execution. Your orchestration could be much longer. Um, this leads to a bunch of patterns that are, you can actually, you could absolutely write the code for these. Um, that's a, that can be very yeah. Uh, gets quite <clears throat> complex very quick. Uh, my favorite example is the fan out, fan in pattern that you see on the screen here. Um, it's one thing to say, "Hey, I'm going to you know fan this out and you know call a bunch of these other functions. I'm going to put a message into three queues or whatever, and then they're going to go off and be processed. That's fine. Now I need at the end of all that, every execution that came out of any of those queues. Okay, I need to make sure that once all of them are done, then I can move on to the next step. That's the part that actually gets a little bit harder. 
So Durable makes it a little bit easier by exposing the orchestration as a function itself. So here's that fan out, fan in example that we were just talking about. So you'll notice that in the attribute there, it's an orchestration trigger. So that's one of the things that's brought in by Durable. And uh, it exposes a context object that uh, gives us a few other methods and things that we'll talk about in a moment. But for this one, I mean, we're just doing a generic example to match that slide, uh, the, the diagram that we just saw. So we're doing this context at call activity async. So we're just invoking another function that's part of the Durable uh, setup here. And then we're just looping through and doing that middle chunk of we're going to kick off a bunch of ones in parallel. The, the magic here is the task.winall. So again, a standard construct that you, know, you might uh, have bumped into plenty before. But um, that's allowing us to say, hey, this orchestration is actually going to checkpoint itself and wait for when all of those are actually done. And then it will proceed into the next step and fire off, in this case, that third function, function uh, F3 there. Um, so I mentioned checkpointing. So this is one of the things about Durable and where it gets basically its name, Durable. If at any point things go wrong, this thing, it, it can checkpoint and restore itself. So once it does that first call activity async, the state is stored. That work batch object is known. And when the, the orchestration trigger actually goes to sleep when the activity gets called. So we run through up to the first activity call, get that off, orchestration goes away. Orchestration will eventually wake up once that other activity is completed, replay its history, and continue from there. So this also means that you, if you have certain sort of mission critical uh, processes, you can do things like have error handling, poison queue management, and things like that, um, that encapsulate some of the fault tolerance that you might have, uh, have needs for in your overall application. It gets advanced pretty quick, um, but the nice thing about Durable is it makes a lot of those things way simpler. Um, this is code that, for me, is way more friendly than uh, if I were to try and embark on the exact same task myself. So we just want to make sure folks are aware of Durable, but we also want to highlight that you know, that and a bunch of the other things we've been talking about have been going through a lot of evolution. And specifically, we've been making functions work a lot more tightly with the latest features of .NET and the general ecosystem, as well as the patterns that are common there. Um, so that's hopefully something that we've covered a good bit today. Um, and if you're familiar with functions, uh, if you've been working with us for a while, um, this might be really interesting to you. Uh, there's a lot here that has changed, and we are pretty pleased with the way that things integrate with the broader .NET ecosystem, and we're excited about where that's going to be going, going forward. Um, there are a ton of features here that, um, yeah, again, you may not even be aware of if you're a long-time functions user. We want to make sure folks are... are on those. There was a quick question. Yeah, sure. Going back to the last slide. Was the... Uh, the the, so the question was about how the going through the tasks in parallel affects the retrying. Um, so the retry. Oh, I just accidentally hit the. Uh, cable that's giving us our presentation, stand by. <laughs> so this is a great example of a fault you being injected um, <laughs> and our uh, ability to recover from it. Um, that's part of the orchestration <laughs> logic of this presentation. Um, but the, the kicking off to multiple tasks is the, the actual goal. So um, in some cases, you might do uh, for, say, uh, order processing is like the classic orchestration example I think people go to. Um, if you have to do sub-fulfillment or going out to different things, that's like represented as your business logic. So the task here is defined in just the, the actual application domain. But uh, the word batch is just how we're accomplishing that notion of, hey, I've gotten through this function one. So like order has been submitted, and now I'm doing like some fulfillment tasks that are being kicked off. Um, let's call them like approvals or completion tasks for uh, somebody to, to go do elsewhere in the organization or whatever. Um, we're basically then saying, hey, I only care about moving forward once all of those are done. So like um, maybe another uh, framing of that example is uh, perhaps I need approvals from like three different people, right? So I'm going to go su submit a, a request for an approval to all of them. Uh, and then only once everyone has approved is where we can move on to the last bit. 
Um, so we're, we're, we're defining that as the, the core business logic. The checkpointing occurs so that uh, when somebody doesn't approve and throws an exception, let's say, um, I don't have to start over from the very beginning and deal with um, you know, prerequisite steps. Um, we're able to kind of pick back up and do retries for, okay, they didn't approve, but we just need to like, you know, uh, kick off the next bit. That could be either in logic that um, you're building into the application or there's ways actually uh, for durable to um, have your orchestration state is something you can interact with as well. Um, yeah, yep, the checkpointing is built in so that it is um, sort of transparent. Uh, but yeah, like it, that, that is um, a feature of durable that uh, just makes it so that when you have these complex orchestrations, they're uh, resilient uh, to, to different types of things that can happen. And you know, I, I, I framed that as uh, a business example in terms of like why things are going wrong. But um, certainly network hiccups happen, um, you know, or uh, data is in the wrong format for a given like, you know, case. Um, so that kind of error handling, being able to recover from that, uh, especially when you have much, much bigger orchestrations than this, uh, can be very critical. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, another question? Yeah, so the, the question here is the premium hosting plan as a means of dealing with longer run functions or does something like this? I would say look to something like this if you're breaking it in discrete activities that themselves fit within that window. Um, or, or that, yeah. I think though one of the problems is you do have to all startup time, right? You yeah. You guys guarantee, don't guarantee put startup on consumption. I think that. So the, the, let me reframe that. So. Uh, the, the, the statement was that you might have um, cold startup time in the consumption plan. So that's where I was saying, hey, we're going from zero to one instance. That's going to be the most performance impacting part where we have to load in all of your code, all of our stuff, things like that. You did say minutes. It's certainly not that anymore. There, there, were, there were times where that might be alleged. Um, but alleged? No, no. I know, experience. <laughs> yes, fair enough. Um, the cold start is uh, something that Absolutely exists, absolutely matters for a certain number of applications. Uh, the n part of the performance improvements that we've been doing have dropped that pretty dramatically. So again, if you're uh, familiar with functions, worth looking at that bit again. But um, that's one of the things that Elastic Premium can help with is because you already have it warm with a, a, an instance that's already been provisioned for you. Yeah, right. Yeah, for your specific case, I think yeah, Elastic Premium might be a good fit there if you don't have the ability to break it up into smaller functions. Uh, but yeah, any any place where you have the opportunity to maybe refactor or break things up, that's where this is extremely helpful. Yeah. Now, uh, it's worth mentioning, this is one way to do multiple functions operating in concert with one another. Um, it is not the only way. Certainly, uh, in some cases, if you don't need some of the behaviors of durable, there's other options like using a message queue, having a queue trigger like we saw before. Um, but it is something that we find uh, a lot of folks, when they need durable, it is truly a, a, a huge asset. Um, and uh, it's, it's very frequently something that folks point to as like the big thing for um, a lot of their applications. So we just want to make sure that everybody's aware of it. And there's plenty of good stuff in terms of like, I, I, we talked about one pattern here. Um, there's plenty of others that I think uh, I think our docs are pretty good on that one, actually. So yes. uh, yeah. it, it, durable is something to definitely learn more so about. A lot of helpful documentation on scenarios and what patterns you would you would use durable for, uh, depending on scenarios and requirements. And and for cold start, if you're seeing anything that is uh, so, our baseline today uh, is under a second. Uh, you should have a function start up and serve uh, a request, an HTTP request in under a second. Uh, if you're seeing anything beyond that that you can't account for, uh, by all means, yeah, we, we want to hear about that. We, we perform daily measurements. Uh, that, that, that's a, an area of, of intense focus for the team, and it's an area that, that's seen a lot of improvement 
in the past few years. Uh, and baseline is, is certainly quite a bit under a second today. It's worth mentioning, Fabio mentioned HTTP triggers. Um, cold start is sometimes also not as scary as it may sound even when it is large, uh, just because some of your functions are responding to events. They may be actually asynchronous background tasks, in which case it absolutely depends on your application and what, what performance characteristics you require. But uh, for many, if it's asynchronous happening in the background, that extra little bit of time is not a major concern. But HTTP, if you have a client waiting you know, actively, um, especially if it's like a human user sitting there waiting for a page to load or something like that, right? That's where it really, really matters. And that's where some of that tuning is especially important where you know you might want to be looking at something more like elastic premium but for for many for many workloads it's um it, it is something that's there and you should be aware of and uh but it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a major factor in plan evaluation if you're not doing anything that uh has a has a client waiting for it actively Okay, so just to recap really quickly, so uh, there are three parts to that. One was uh, that you're having uh, differences between, say, Linux and Windows, and that's actually something to, to note is that uh, there are, within those hosting options, you have different, uh, different OS choices and a few other considerations you can tune as well. Um, it does depend on the stack and things like that, but yeah, um, the, the cold start numbers might be different uh, on particularly probably the consumption plan between Windows and Linux, and that's something to be aware of for sure. Um, but then within that, uh, the, there were two things. Uh, one was the async pattern in Durable, um, which if you jump back one slide, please. Um, the notion of um, uh, that sort of, uh, I guess, fifth, the middle bottom one there. Um, this is a really good pattern, actually. Um, this is, uh, so the idea here is that you would, um, Potentially acknowledge the request, uh, take a return an accepted code, um, and the Durables provides a, a, a basically something that can go in the location header to allow whatever client it is to kind of pull back and say, "Hey, is that task done yet?" Um, so your client can not be waiting for like a standing HTTP request that then might get timed out by a middle tier or something like that between you and the function, uh, but the client is actively monitoring it. It's better for UX spinners or anything like that. Um, so that's a very powerful pattern. So like you've returned accepted, you've enqueued the work, and then you're knowing that that work is asynchronously being processed. Um, so that's one. And then the third point that you raised was also, I think, just app service plan. Again, if, if you're looking at something like Elastic Premium, that's a great choice as well. A lot of the same characteristics there. You're not getting the event-driven scaling, but you are getting certain baselines of you're getting more control over the actual hardware class that you're running on. Uh, and some of the characters, and it's always on. So, sure, yeah, yeah. Premium will will kind of bring the best of both worlds into that. Give a, a little more flexibility there. Yeah. So, a few different options there. Um, I hope we we covered the right of the questions in full. Just looking at the folks we've been asking, make sure we're good. Um, jumping back, I guess. So, uh, we we've hit on a few of these features that um, have been. Uh, you know, iterations over functions. So uh, again, if you're a long-standing user, a lot of these might be uh, new and worth taking a look at. Um, we highlighted a few of them, and again, some things have been in previews, um, moving into GA status, uh, general availability, um, so with full support. Uh, but we're, we're, we're pretty pleased with how functions lands in the broader .NET ecosystem and how it's able to take advantage of some of the newer things happening in .NET, which... Another comment on, on cold start, one of the things that, that might not be clear, a lot of the performance improvements that we were describing here that will make the, the instance performance significantly better, even if it doesn't have a significant impact on the, the overall cost uh, at the end because you're scaling more in a consumption environment, you're not paying per instance, uh, it does reduce the number of cold starts. Uh, so having that, it, it does enable us to more densely pack workloads in a, in a single instance. So those things at the end of the day still matter a lot and bring significant benefits, uh, overall performance benefits. Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, and and uh, as you lean up sort of your functions, you'll you'll see that sort of compound on itself uh, because of factors like that. Um, it is you know truly like we mentioned those best practices of single responsibility own less. Um, make sure that you're you know managing your connection pooling, um, keeping your memory profile low. Those things add up for those performance characteristics and things as well. So um, if you are liking what you're seeing here, uh, if there's uh, things that you're um, looking to either upgrade from existing versions of functions or existing versions of .NET. Um, one thing we also want to highlight is the .NET Upgrade Assistant. Um, even if you forget everything we've said about functions, this is worth knowing as a .NET developer. Um, it's an extension in Visual Studio that allows you to move uh, from across .NET versions, helps do some of the scaffolding code management changes to uh, address you know, uh, the differences between the .NET versions, as well as in functions, uh, any changes that might have to occur there. Uh, it's not going to do everything for you if you're, you know, moving where uh, you have an old version of like the Azure Storage SDK. Uh, you'll need to, you know, do some work to to bring it up to the to the newer versions. But um, it gets you a lot of the way there, um, and it's uh, we we highly recommend this tool. It's kind of indispensable, especially as we look towards uh, the next major version of .NET, .NET 8, um, being able to to just sort of very quickly. Uh, uh, migrate uh, older projects forward um, is super valuable. So just wanted to make sure folks know about that. Um, and I mentioned this before, but Azure Functions is open source. Uh, if you want to uh, take a look at uh, our GitHub repos, um, all of this code is there. Uh, that's where uh, we engage with the community. Please uh, feel free to file issues there. Um, we accept pull requests, uh, but uh, that's, uh, we have a you know, good ecosystem of .NET developers uh, all uh, you know, working with functions, and that's sort of where we centralize things. So, lastly, um, there's lots of good resources. That community provides plenty as well. Um, I'm sure you can find lots of good uh, stuff out there. But uh, Microsoft Learn has a, a lot of great content. We're updating it constantly, especially as we roll out lots of uh, new things. Um, so, please, by all means, check those out. And uh, with that, I think we're just going to do Q&A for the rest of the session. Um, so thank you very much. If you wouldn't mind filling out the survey, we do appreciate it. Um, but otherwise, uh, yeah, thank you. And uh, we'll take questions. Yeah. Got one right at the end. Oh, thanks. Thank you. Absolutely. So the question was, um, can you self-host and then maybe start something on-prem and then take it into Azure uh, later or you know, on behalf of other customers? Absolutely. Um, so because we have sort of the, um, uh, the, the runtime itself open source and available um, and, and the base image is published, um, we just absolutely see folks doing that. Um, most of the time, you're going to be probably interacting with Azure services uh, as part of it. Um, just for the event sources and things like that. Um, so there is sometimes a, a kind of implied bridge to Azure uh, through that. But um, yeah, people absolutely happily run uh, this on their own stacks uh, all the time. Um, in fact, um, we did a collaborative project with Red Hat to bring the event-driven scaling uh, to Kubernetes as well. It's a project called Keda, K-E-D-A. Um, so uh, we have a lot of folks who take the functions base images, they run them in Kubernetes with Keda. So they get the event-driven scaling, but on their own infrastructure through, uh, you know, that orchestration layer of their choice. So, and, and that's a fairly common approach for a lot of customers today, uh, particularly in hybrid scenarios where they want to run some of the workloads on prem, some of the workloads on the cloud, but the team wants to use the same programming model. Uh, they, they leverage functions and they they leverage those different hosting options there. Yeah, um, and you know we have IoT devices here. I mean, we've also got functions running on Raspberry Pis out there, which I think is fun. Um, but uh, yeah, in general, um, the programming model is very flexible. A lot of functions tend to be uh, net new applications in a lot of cases, but they're also really good at helping stitch together workloads. And if you need to bring together any existing assets or um, you know, they're, they're not bad for hybrid uh, situations where you may have some on-prem assets, some in the cloud, uh, and you need sort of a bridging solution. Um, sprinkling some functions throughout your 
your uh, your infrastructure topology uh, can be a, can be really helpful in those situations as well. Yes. Right, so the question was, if you have app service already, and uh, when would you choose function observer web jobs? Uh, just to define that. So web jobs is actually um, a, an aspect of uh, app service. There's a couple different varieties of it, but they fill a similar niche. In fact, functions was actually born out of the web jobs project originally. Um, so uh, if you're using web jobs, that is absolutely a happy, a fine place to be, um, especially for, uh, for, for when it's, uh, it's, it's part of the application payload itself that you're deploying to the web app. Um, so when those are very tightly coupled to those web apps, uh, that can be a much better solution. Uh, but for a lot of situations, especially when you're dealing with um, needs for these more elastic workloads, um, instead of having it running on those dedicated plans, being able to have this sort of more uh, event-driven scaling and only bring up those uh, assets when needed um, that tends to be one angle. But. HTTP scenarios too. Um, so oh, yeah, web jobs will not have support for HTTP triggered uh, workloads. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, you do. Uh, the ability to combine web API with some of the other web jobs triggers and bindings that, that it is where the limitation is where functions will provide that out of the box. Uh, so you have the ability to leverage the web jobs programming model with an HTTP based set of APIs. Uh, and that's where you've seen a lot of uh, tooling uh, investments as well, the hosting options, yeah. scaling behavior, uh, the, the more serverless approach uh, will be in functions. Uh, again, a lot of the functionality, if you're using web jobs, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, yeah. You can continue to use that, particularly if you already have app services and you're leveraging that. It with that said, um, I mean, we are here presenting functions and uh, we do think in general that it's a a uh, better model to be putting most folks towards if you are looking at a net new project, um, and if it's if it's if that decision is more of a, you know, burden you know is less clear. We are kind of indicating functions tend to be better for most users. Um, so uh, I would only point somebody at web jobs really if they were already familiar with it and kind of uh, had those those needs. Uh, so there's a few different, when I say better, I guess I'm conflating a few different things. Um, it's not necessarily the performance aspect as much as it is um, some of the uh, ways of doing error handling. Uh, the monitoring solutions are a little bit more robust in general. Um, monitoring is by far one of the things that I think with serverless in particular um, comes up quite a bit. Um, we've defined small bits of single responsibility functions. That's great but then you suddenly have a bunch of different components. And so now you have really, you're not dealing with a single monolithic thing where your tracing is more managed. Uh, you now have distributed tracing concerns more broadly uh, and things like that. Um, so especially if you're dealing with lots of them, uh, monitoring is a good example. Um, there's a few others where, in terms of usability and where some of the feature investment is. Web jobs also um, is just a little bit, uh, Fabi mentioned the HTTP trigger. There's a couple others that I think are more unique, the durable, piece in particular is unique to functions as well. Um, so there are a couple of things there where there's a bit more feature richness on the function side. That's where a lot more investment's been, but um, yeah. And some of the modern features like uh, middleware I and mean, some of those yeah. things, you, you're seeing that come to the functions.net experience, even though that builds on top of web jobs for a lot of that stuff, you're not gonna have that readily available to you in, in web jobs. Yeah, so just in terms of even feature breadth and you know, starting off on a foot that, that won't, we, we don't want users to be uh, in a situation where they start a solution and then run into a limitation that's counter to our goals. Um, so we think functions is just a, a safer bet for getting a new project started, but there's nothing wrong with the web jobs answer. Thanks, for me, it's like, web jobs are like .NET FX, nothing wrong with it. But you have done so much with functions at, between UI, the monitoring, the experience, that Yeah, I mean, it, yeah, the, the, the comparison was just made against .NET Framework, and just to clarify, that both support both, um, you know, uh, core and, and framework, but. Again, if, if web jobs is meeting your current requirements, you already have that investment there. Nothing wrong with leveraging the plans you're already uh, paying for, uh, that, that, that is just, that, that, that is fine. 
Other questions? Did we do that good? There's got to be more. There we go. Yeah. Yeah, so the question was throttling and dealing with a downstream resource that might be um, you know, overwhelmed. By, yeah. yeah, something that you're overwhelming, yeah. Uh, it, that will depend a little bit on the trigger type that you're using. Different triggers will have different concurrency knobs that are available to you. Uh, things like controlling the, the batch size or how many messages you can uh, process concurrently. Uh, that will differ when comparing like, things like service bus, event hubs, uh, storage queues. Um, so we, we provide documentation on what those, those options are. Uh, there are also limits that you can apply at the function app level that will limit how far the platform will scale you out uh, before it, it stops. Uh, but there is a significant amount of investment happening right now to actually improve that and provide e even more fine-grained control over your concurrency uh, modeling, how many functions you want to see executing in parallel. Exactly for, for that reason. You want to protect a, protect a downstream resource, uh, we will have better controls in place that will uh, enable you to more, more granularly control uh, you know, how many executions you have. And, and the model that we showed in terms of like connection pooling using the iClients is also a big deal, especially for yeah. certain types of downstream resources that care a little bit more about their connections. I'm thinking SQL. Um, SQL loves to fall over when you throw a bunch of connections at it uh, really fast and a lot of them. Um, so that's just one place that it can help to, to, to bound some of that. Um, where it's a little bit more stateful as well. Um, the other thing is that some of the application patterns that we were discussing uh, uh, can, can factor in as well. So um, if you do get a throttling or something like that, um, you can do sort of back off strategies either through uh, in queuing new work to be picked up by a, uh, at something that's going to do retry. Durable can be used for some of that. Um, uh, but you know, also um, even, even just uh, with messages that you have, if there's something that's odd about a queue message that causes it to be failed, uh, we might put that into a poison queue. And that's something that uh, is just a general pattern for, hey, uh, this wasn't able to succeed for some reason. We need to go back and do it either as part of some cleanup batch or something. Maybe you have a timer that goes and evaluates those. Um, or just it gets re-entered back into the, the thing that would kick off that function. Um, did you mention uh, the trigger type? Did you say it was queues or service bus? or? Yeah. yeah. So, so, so service bus also, um, you know, has all the different message settlement type things, which is something that uh, in the .NET model uh, is, is is actually something we're evolving as basically that's happening right now. Um, and, and the trigger will provide some of the, the configuration knobs that you can tweak to to define how many messages you want to see, how many functions you want to see invoke uh, at the same time within a given instance, uh, and you can apply some of those more app level global controls that will limit the scale behavior the platform will apply. It's a combination of those will essentially add up to, to the maximum number of concurrent invocations you have today. And then from there, you know, any, any error handling from that downstream is just a matter of figuring out what makes sense for how you handle retries, really. Other questions? We've got a few more minutes. Wait, if there are no questions, then, oh, one more. Yeah, no, yeah. Yeah, I'm oh, sorry, just restating the question. Yeah, so the existing apps, .NET 6, um, your distinction with the in-proc and isolated model, which we didn't really touch on, but um, two different models for .NET applications, isolated being the slightly newer one that has some of the more of the features that we were showcasing. And looking at .NET 8, um, I guess the question was, what was the, what's the thing that needs to be looked at? Like, do you need to look at isolated or it was specifically dependency injection and how you were handling uh, conf that? Configuration injection, right? So you have a configuration builder. You, know, you add in custom configuration sources. Um, 
Yeah. For at .NET 8 specifically, at RTM time, you will see that support coming to the isolated model first. Uh, in fact, the beauty of the isolated model is that really you're just changing a TFM yeah. um, in, in your CS Proj. So if you wanted to be using the .NET 8 previews right now, at least locally, you'd be fine. You just wouldn't be able to publish it to Azure um, and run it on .NET 8 there. Yeah, the the but, key thing about the, that model is how it decouples you from the version of .NET that's being used by the host itself. Uh, so it gives you a lot of flexibility to be either ahead or behind the host, uh, depending on what your requirements are. Uh, you can run today isolated using .NET Framework. So we do have full support for .NET Framework in, in that isolated model. If you're looking to move to .NET 8 at RTM time, exactly when it comes out. Like the very day, like hours after the, 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 the announcement kind yeah. of thing. Then that upgrade will be a requirement. You will need to, to move to isolated and uh, move to that model. Uh, luckily, that upgrade assistant, uh, assistant will hopefully be of help. Yeah. Uh, you can point your existing project to it and it will take you to the isolated model. It will replicate a lot of that. The logic, you just need to you know, massage some APIs that may be uh, that the upgraded system is not aware of. Um, yeah, part of the trend here also is that you mentioned overriding the configuration and things like that. Isolated removes a little bit of that in that it does it a little bit more with the traditional config building approach. Um, so you're more directly in control there. There's still a few things that are loaded by default, but there's less, um, I guess, how would you put it? Like, just there's, there's, there's less uh, danger, I suppose, with interfacing with that. Yeah, the the um, behavior there is very consistent with the, the rest of the, the .NET ecosystem, right? So yeah. it's the same behavior you would expect from different application types. Uh, you have full control over your dependencies, configuration injection, the four configuration sources. All of that will work identically to you know, some of the other models. Yeah, so I mean, if, if that's something that you're considering just in terms of how you want to handle your .NET strategy and so forth, Certainly better to get ahead of it just in terms of that way that when the day comes for .NET 8, it's just that TFM switch. Um, but yeah, I mean, we think that the configuration model there should be a bit cleaner and so that if you're looking to sort of get rid of, I guess, any anything that you've had to custom handle around that. Um, it, certainly, again, uh, I'm gonna, I probably sound like a little bit of a broken record, but owning less is great. Um, I, I love deleting code, um, so, uh, you know, uh, that, that is an advantage of the other model. Well, we'll Great. be hanging around here. If folks want to come up and ask questions if, uh, after we get off mic. Thank you all. Really Thanks again. Yeah.